Welcome to another episode of the Rhino Show podcast. Uh, every time I say we have an amazing guest, but uh, my next guest uh, goes by the name of Dr. Sam Bakhtiar. I watched so many interviews on him and he says, you know, he never wants to be that guy when he was going to school where the, the teacher, the lady came in and said, don't call me Mrs. Call me doctor. But the fact that he has went to school, achieved such a you know, notable title. I think it's only respectful that we we do uh, say Dr. Sam Bakhtiar. But the rest of the interview will be Sam. If I can call you Sam, I hope that's okay. Oh, that's perfect. Um, yeah, that's perfect. Um, you know, again, if, if, if you haven't heard of Sam and you haven't watched his content, one of my main driving forces of wanting to have him on the show was, it, you know, to see somebody who's done extremely well, uh, but so humble. I watched him him cry when he mentions his, his, his daughters and his why and things like that. And it's just, I don't know, things just resonated. So uh, I want to go really deep with Sam. I'm going to give you his bio just so, again, if you haven't heard of him, you can check him out. Everything will be in the show notes as always. But Sam is a refugee turned divorcee on the verge of bankruptcy to multimillionaire, champion, bodybuilder, author, doctor, and CEO of multiple worldwide brands. Dr. Sam Bakhtiar is an American success story with humble beginnings and a meteoric rise to wealth and influence. As founder of the Camp Transformation Center's 110 plus locations and the 1% ER movement, Sam inspires modern adults and youth to discover their 1% potential and excel in the five F's, which is my favorite, faith, family, fitness, finance. And to be honest, I love the last word, which is fun. You're having fun yeah, while doing fun. that. Can you I tell me how, Sam, welcome to the show first off, man. Thank you so much. Well, Ryan, man, it's an honor and privilege to be on your show. I remember when we talked, oh, it was about a month or so ago. Correct. And when he asked that, I'm like, I'm honored to be on your show, man. And I know you uh, you just deliver so much awesome content for everybody. You know, I know you take a lot of time to bring so much value to people. So I just want to congratulate you on that. And, and thank, thank you for having me on the show. Thank you, man. Thank you. Uh, I want to kick off with, with my first question. And, you know, here, just so you kind of understand how our show works, is our whole mandate is curiosity. So the one word that we really try to circle everything around is provoke. I, I, You know, you work out your muscles. I encourage people to work out their muscles and their brain. I think when you're mentally <laughs> strong, it, 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 it seeps into all aspects of your life. And I love to go places that people don't necessarily want to go because I feel like that's where the magic truly is. And, you know, when we when we have guests on, I just try to make it feel like two friends having a, a fantastic conversation, you know, and very, very casual that way. So what uh, you come over? I know you start over in Pennsylvania, small little town, you and your mom. You talk a lot about your childhood. You talk a lot about the fact that you didn't have, you know, a father or, or a male figure to really look up to. You talk about the fact that, again, you're Persian. So, you know, Iranian culture, you know, it's, you know, be a doctor, be a lawyer, you know, be a dentist, something that has that notoriety. You mentioned several times how your mom just was not supportive of, you know, the gym side of things. And to this day, when you went and got your doctorate, that, that's the thing that she's extremely proud of. Whereas you build this whole conglomerate, but she's like, yeah, but you're a doctor. <laughs> so. So, uh, why, how, how has this made you feel? How has this propelled you um, into kind of getting started down the path that you you've actually chosen for yourself? You know, you know, Ryan, man, it's like it, it's just if I have to sum it in one word. You know, when you look at back and connect all the dots. Remember, Steve Jobs said that you can't connect the dots moving forwards, right? Mm. You connect the dots moving backwards. And a lot of times, when I look back at my life. And you saw all the devastation and all the hardship and everything that I went through. Mm. You know, God was preparing me for greatness. Mm. You know, God was preparing me to to uh, to level up. I, I, I truly believe that, you know, when God gives you trials and tribulations, you know, God is testing you to see if you're worthy of his blessing. Mm. See, a lot of times man, he makes us question God. You know, he makes us question our faith. But if you're strong enough and just weather the storm, he has something huge at the end for you waiting. You know, and when I look back, man, everything, you know, I, I can just sum it in what one, one word. God's plan. Mm, okay. Okay. I'm Canadian. I'm Canadian. So we got Drake yeah, up I'm here. So. Drake. I did that on purpose. <laughs> 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 I appreciate that. So, so faith is very much a, a part of that, but 
if you go back to when you're, you know, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 years old, you know, teenage years, I mean, you know, as a girls, guys, doesn't matter. I mean, these are years where your emotions are riding high. They're all over the place. Some days you feel great. Other days you feel like, what the hell is my life, you know, kind of equated to. I can really re- resonate with your story, too, because I was raised by a single mom. My mom passed away when I was 13 years old, which left me just punched in the mouth, you know, and never had a dad. But, you know, my mom gave me so many different fundamentals and love. And people ask me this day, I said, listen, the love and support and confidence that my mom instilled in me in 13 years, I will take over a lifetime of having a bad parent. So I'm so even though people think of that as maybe man, Ryan, that sucks. I see the goodness in all of that, and I'm extremely thankful for that. But you talk so much about your childhood, and I think that when I see adults, you know, who kind of are, you know, on the precipice of, you know, well, I'd like to do better in my life, they're still holding on to that baggage of a childhood. Your childhood is such a is such a foundational point of your life that how did you get over that? How did you find ways to say, okay, maybe I don't have a dad and maybe my mom is not the most supportive of my dream, but where did you look for those little incremental things of source of inspiration for you? So Ryan, man, it, it's very simple for me. You know, um, I come from, a, like I said, a very tough upbringing, mm. very tough. You know, whether it was getting bombed on, you know, in Iran, which was nothing compared to coming to the United States and being ridiculed and being called all kinds of names and, Mm. you know, with racist comments and all that kind of stuff. But I think you you have two choices in life. When you have some scars or some baggage that's happened to you in the past, Mm. you can either say, poor me, or you can say, try me. (laughs) I like that. I like that. Right? I like that. So, so in the beginning, you know, it was poor me for me. You know, I was playing that victim mentality. I told my mom, I want to go back home. I don't want to go back to Iran. Man, nobody likes me here. People are making fun of me. I'm getting beat up in school. I've been calling, getting called names, you know, and all that kind of stuff. But then when I started lifting weights, you know, when I started lifting weights, it shifted me, not just physically, but it gave me an outlet to take out my aggression, my, my, my hurt. But it also, once I, you know, I got over that, it just totally changed the way I thought about things. Because if I can get under 200 pounds, I never thought I could lift the 200 pounds before. And I can now lift it after a few months of just working, working, working. Then I knew that I could do anything that I could. You know? And so that's why I was so passionate about what I do. You know, to me, physical exercise Physical transformation is the first stepping stone for you to change your life and catapult your life. You know, and, you know, my good friend Tim Grover always says that, you know, the best of the best actually have emotional scarring and emotional baggage. They, they call it their dark side. Mm. So you can either have your dark side control you and make, and destruct, you know, destroy you by you going drinking and doing drugs and gambling, whatever the fuck you want to get into, you know, um, but, um, or you can use it as fuel to get better, as fuel to, to show the naysayers, as fuel to catapult your success. For me, not having a dad has made me a super dad. Mm. Like I'm that super dad. Like, I, I literally overcompensate. I literally overcompensate. Like I'll cancel trips. If, if all of a sudden, you know, you know, you know I see my, my daughter has a recital, you know, it, 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 it's on it's on a trip day that I'm supposed to go out of town. I'll cancel it. I'm going to the recital, you know, because just because I didn't have that in growing up. And, you know, I'm always looking the corner. Where's my dad? Where's my dad? How come everybody else's dad is here cheering him on? You know, I don't you know, he made me he made me a super dad. So everything that in the past has just crumbled me has made me so much stronger. Remember, when you when you have a scar on your face or your body, you know, what does that scar do? That's basically scar tissue to protect you from the next trauma. Mm. You know? Mm. And, and in a way now, in a way now when life punches you in the face, I mean, look, you see me here, you see me in my mansion right now. I'm in, I'm in my office. You see me driving exotic cars and have this all this. It's all good, but that doesn't mean I don't have problems. That doesn't mean I don't get punched in the face. You know, I still get punched in the face. There's, there's days that I'm like, oh my God, like, you know, but here's, here's the thing. You have a choice. The punch in the face and, and retreat or punch in the face and laugh. Yeah, you got me with a good one, man. I got you. I got you. 
<laughs> you know what? You you bring up a few you bring up a few points, Sam. And I mean, just so, for everybody listening too, you know, I hope they touch on it. You almost overcompensate. You're a super dad. Um, what I love about you, and it's interesting, you came on my radar because I was watching a Manny uh, Koshpin uh, a video, and I was like, "Who's this Manny guy?" And then there's something about him; it just really drew me in. I'm like, "Okay, interesting." And then all of a sudden, you came on, and it, my first impression of you was, "This guy is dying his beard. He's got these muscles, nice glasses." But then once I start kind of going down the digital deep dive on you, I'm like, extremely emotional. You're very connected to your emotion. Even though you're in a, a field that, you know, we talk about masculinity and all these and, you know, all these different movements with Me Too and equality and social justice and whatnot, you're, you, 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 you take what you do and how you portray yourself, but you're not at all afraid or scared to really show, hey, man, this is the jelly beans inside. This is the soft part of me. You know, when I see people that are, you know, willing to cry over their passions, when I see people who are willing just to put it all out there, I, I can't tell you how that makes me feel and makes other people feel extremely relatable. Well, Ryan, you know, the um, normally I'm a I'm a jelly bean. Mm. I'm a jelly bean. <laughs> you know, I'm a normally I'm very emotional. I'm a jelly bean. I cry. You know, I, I cry at fucking Lion King. That's that's the jelly bean. I'm, I'm fucking sitting down there, you know, watching Lion King, you know, with, with with my daughter, and I'm going like, I'm going like this, you know, my my my, my six year old daughter, Daddy, you okay? Yeah, I'm okay. You know, I'm going like this. You know, I'm normally a jelly bean. You know what I mean? You know, what you see on the outside is what the world has made me. Mm. You know, you know what? Well, you know, you know, you know, I had to become strong on the outside. I had to be able to protect myself. You know what I mean? I ha- I had to be able to have my guards up. You know, that doesn't mean that. You know, I'm I'm not I don't have emotions. I just know now how to deal with it. Mm-hmm. I, I know how to block it. You know, sometimes I might come out come across as oh the guy like doesn't um, doesn't care or he has no emotions and things like that. You know, I know you know when um, when my wife was pregnant with our twins. You know, and um, we lost it. We lost one of the twins. Mm-hmm. You know, and for me, when something tragic like that happens, I go in automatic preservation mode where. You know, I focus more on work. I focus more on my workouts. I, w- I focus on stuff that keeps my mind away from that because I know that that can throw me down. And then, you know, some people think like, oh my God, he doesn't care. But they don't They don't see me crying while I'm working out. Mm. They don't see me going in my room and breaking down, you know what I mean? But on the outside world, it looks something like, oh my God, he's just like this big, strong buff guy who, who has no emotions and no, no, it's totally the opposite way around. You, you know, it's funny because we, we live in a, a world now that I, I always feel like anybody who, who has a smartphone and, you know, takes that selfie or, or sends any kind of content out, whether it's an Instagram story, a YouTube video, I always say, be very careful what you're saying to people. Uh, take responsibility over the words that are coming out of your mouth. We call it hustle porn, where you got the Gary Vaynerchuks of the world and they're hustle, hustle, hustle. But I'm I'm happy that even somebody like him says, I'm going to take a camera and I'm going to show you what this actually really takes. Because you don't want to lead people down this path of, hey, you're sitting in your mansion, the cars, you got everything. But it's like, there's an ultimate price you have to pay for that. That does not just show I'll up. Pay <laughs> I'll pay it. Bro, I paid it. Paid it tenfold, man. You know, uh, you know, you name it, man. I mean, they don't what what they don't see. You know, like I said, I, I saw a meme the other day that was that, that was pretty cool. He says, "Don't compare your chapter one to some somebody's chapter 50. You know, something like that. You know, you know, they don't see. You know that. You know, I've leveraged everything. I lost homes. I foreclosed on homes. I went bankrupt, literally bankruptcy. To this day, I can't even get a Costco credit card. You know what I mean? Like, like, <laughs> I heard you say that. <laughs> Bro, I have an 830, 825 credit score. I can't get a Costco credit card. Even 20 years ago, it still comes on my fucking record. You know, I was willing to get a Costco card and I got denied. I got millions of dollars in the fucking bank. And, and you know, you know, and, and Chris goes around like, what do you mean? You know, I, I did one of those old tricks in the hood. I said, babe, babe, can I get a Costco card on your name? You know, like, <laughs> Like back in the day when I used to put the phone in my mama's name, you know, you know, but see, they don't see the failed relationship. They don't see the failed marriage that I had. They don't mm. see, you know, the ulcers. They don't, they don't see the couple of times that I had a panic attack. I went to the hospital. I thought I had a heart attack. You know, I, I you know, I, I'm, I'm that strong guy who think I can 
I can take on anything. You know, to me, it was like, oh, I can take on anything. I can take on anything. Bring it. I laugh at stress. I laugh at stress. Come on, bring it in. Then one night, bro, you know, I was, I was, um, I was uh, sleeping. And next thing you know, I couldn't breathe no more. Like somebody like put their, you know, put their boot, like, you know, right here on my chest. I was like, you know, and I went to school, so I know what a heart attack is, right? So I'm like, oh shit, tingling hand, can't breathe. I'm about to go. You know what I mean? Next thing you know, I broke out and just sweat. Like I'm talking about the whole bed was wet, just cold sweat. Next morning, I I, I woke up, I'm like, I'm alive. You know, I went to the hospital. I said, I had a heart attack. You know, you guys had to check me out. I had a heart attack. So they put me on an EKG and they had me walk around for a few days with this heart monitor. It's like, that wasn't a heart attack, that was a panic attack, mm. which to me was a sign of weakness all the time. What do you mean, a panic attack? I'm not, I don't panic on shit. I'm the man, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Bro, that catches up on you, man. Just catch, you know, catches up on you. You know, as human, you, you can only take so much and you have to understand your limits and understand what, you know, anybody can be broken. Your anxiety. So, would you say that you're somebody that has anxiety, has had anxiety, has the potential to have anxiety throughout the course of your life, or is it just certain moments or certain things that you're going through that that evoke these I, kinds I, of reaction? Well, you know, I don't think there's any entrepreneurs out there that are type A personalities and go getters and don't have anxiety. Oh yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, I mean, if, if if you are an entrepreneur and you have even a slight bit of ambition. Mm. You're going to have fucking anxiety because every day you take risks. Every day you start at zero. Every day you fucking grind. You know what I mean? You know what my biggest anxiety is to this day? To this day, my biggest anxiety is being broke. Mm. <laughs> it's days. You know, because I've never, you know, I grew up without anything. Anything. You know, food stamps, welfare, you know, car that we had to push to get started. You know, you, you know about that. Yeah. You know, and... and 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 I didn't I didn't want that for my children, mm. so I went out way, you know, to make sure to set things up and all that kind of stuff. My kids got more money in their in their in investment and college account than I had in my thirties. Mm. Mm. You know, it's inter- it's interesting. Like, all problems start with a s- aspiration. And it's interesting when you look at yourself, every time you want to grow, I do like it. If you want to up your game and level up 5%, you usually always start in the bottom 80, if that makes sense. So every time you want to level up 5%, you start in the bottom 80. A lot of people are consistently fearful of leveling up their game because in some ways you're almost starting over. Like if you want to get from this amount of money to that amount of money, when you get to that level, you're starting over and it's that rinse and repeat that happens. So for you... The fact that your childhood was extremely humble, you know, you come from humble beginnings, very, very little means, you don't want to be broke. Do you think that's something that can ever, ever leave you to feel that actual sense of security? Or is the sick nah. person in you actually kind of like it? You kind of like it. I don't, I don't know if I like, you know, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe psychologically I like it. Maybe that psychologically that's what drives me. I don't know, you know, you know, you, you, you know, I don't know, man, you know, so I know that I got that inner desire to hustle. You know what I mean? To hustle. You know what I mean? All the, and a desire to make shit happen. Not just, it's just not money wise. I, I just like to progress as a human being. But I'm mm-hmm. telling you right now, like, you know, fear of being broke for me is real. You know, because yeah. I never want yeah. my children to experience what I experiment. You know what I mean? You know, I'm, I'm, I gotta be from one of the best providers for my family because I didn't have a provider. Yeah. You know what I mean? I, you know, you know, my kids want stuff, I'm not, not, not to, to a way to spoil them or, or, or give them everything, but I'm there to provide them all everything they need for them to be able to have a good life. To me, that's so important. Have you ever chatted with your father as a, as a, as a, as, as a person you are today at the position you are, or is he still alive or is that a touchy subject? I I, 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 just okay. curious. He passed away. Okay. Sorry to yeah, hear he that. Passed away. Yeah, my father was unfortunately um, an alcoholic. Okay, you know, and who had a gambling problem, you know, and that's what that's why my parents got divorced when I was three years old. So when I, when he, when he fled the country, I was three years old, and after that, I never saw him again. So um, yeah, man, I mean, you know, so but again, it, you know, you know, I I don't drink alcohol, I don't do drugs, mm. I don't gamble. People are like Sam, go to Vegas and gamble. I don't even gamble five dollars because mm. my father used to gamble. Because my father used to go gamble his paycheck 
that my mom had to go pawn her ring and jewelry to buy diapers. Mm. You know what mm. I mean? So I got that I got that complex inside of my head that I mean I will go out and spend five hundred dollars on a meal, no problem. Mm. You know what I mean? Will not spend five dollars on gambling. You know, it, it's just it, it, the things that's happened in the past, man. I'm like, I don't need that thrill. I don't want. I don't, I don't. Five. If I lose five dollars or twenty dollars, I'm pissed. Mm. <laughs> I love that. Why do you think people at your level? I mean, even uh, you've heard of Patrick, but David from Value Tainment, right? Yeah, yeah I'm, I mean, Pat is great. We had him on the show, and he he was very adamant about you know he doesn't drink, and he said, you know, Ryan, I want to see. A part of me keeping my life completely clean is to seeing the capacity in which I could actually reach. And he just said, yeah. you know, any kind of narcotic or thing that's going to you know, basically make him feel a certain way, he feels that you just could not get to 100% capacity. Is this, is, is, it, is the reason you don't drink for those reasons as well? Or is it more just because you've seen what it did to your mom and then your, your late father? You know, you know, for me, drinking right now means that next day, I'm not going to be at 100%. Mm. And to mm. me, since we all have a finite time in this planet, I want to be one, I, I, I want to be at my peak state as much as I can. Obviously, you know, some days I'm sick, you know, and all that kind of stuff. I can't change what God, but if I can control feeling good, I will control feeling good, especially right now. I mean, I mean, think about it, man. If, if me and my wife go out and we want to have a couple of drinks, next day we're like, kind of hung over and we have kids now. They want to go run around. They want to do things, man. That's not fair to them. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. You know, when, when, I was, when, when I was growing up, man, you know, when I was growing up and stuff like that, you know, I, I drank a little bit, you know, socially, not, you know, and all that kind of stuff, but just socially to fit in, just to be cool, have a couple of drinks and all that kind of stuff. But now, you know, I barely ever touch it. Interesting. No, that, I, I, I love that. So do you feel like with um, kind of projecting that in, it's interesting because one of the questions I do want to ask you, because I know you're Persian is, and I know you're, you're very regimented on what you eat and whatnot, but if there was one dish out there, because <laughs> I, I did ask Patrick this question and he just went all over it. If there was one dish you could eat religiously every single day, if they said, Sam, you can only have one dish for the rest of your life. What dish would that be? What would you actually enjoy eating? Bro, it's hands down cholo kebab. You know, you know, you know, you know, it's, it's, it's a Persian, it's, it's a Persian, you know, barbecue filet mignon and rice. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it's like, um, you know, it's a Persian, like, hands down, man, I, I, would, I would have, you know, uh, I would have, you know, I would have that for sure. So moving on up, uh, you have a YouTube channel, you have your podcast. Um, at what point did you say, I want to start producing content? I want to start talking about my life. I want to start impacting people on a, on a different level at mass scale. The internet has you know, afforded us to have so much reach that you would just never have uh, pre-internet. TV and NBC and CNN, I could care less because, I mean, you got people on YouTube that got, you know, kill their numbers. When did you say, yes. or was there something that happened or something that was said that you said, it's time for me to start creating content, documenting and really pushing out? Well, you know, um, a few people always knew my story, people close to me and they knew my, my, my whole rise and you know everything I went through. They kept asking me, you gotta share this with the world. We gotta share it in this world. But up until last year, you know, I was very involved with in my businesses. Very, very involved, you know, and um, and that didn't give me a lot of money, a lot of extra time for me to go out there and make content, do this kind of stuff, you know, because I was still on the grind, you know, as far as day to day operations. But now, since our company has grown so much, we literally have great people working on us. We have CEOs, CFOs, you know, we have attorneys, you know, and all that kind of stuff. So basically, I'm like an advisor. I'm like a chairman to the company now. You know, and now I have more time to go out there and be able to, you know, to try to have, have a bigger impact in the world. Mm. You know, Tell at me. the end of the day, you know, we talk about, you know, we no. talk about the five F's, you know, faith, family, fitness, finance and fun. And for me, all those five F's lead to that sixth F, which is the biggest F of them all, which is called fulfillment. You know, you know, you know, and like one of my favorite quotes of all time, I mean, this is something that resonates very deep with me, is when Tony Robbins says, success without fulfillment is the ultimate failure. Hell yeah. So, you know, yeah. 
you know, so so when I think about it, I'm like, oh my God, all right. So, you know, I, I've, I've, I'm successful, I have this and I have that, and I have this and I'm like, but if I haven't impacted a person, if I haven't helped on anyone along the way, you know, what good is my life? So when you start getting in, in, in your, you know, in my age, you start thinking about, okay, what is what is the legacy that I want to leave? You know, how many people do I want to help? Do I want to just have all of this and die and not touch anyone else's? So it becomes more than just money or more about that. You got to have your, your heart needs to be happy. It's interesting. You know, I, I live in, I'm in Canada and my wife and I were kind of crazy. So you guys have states, we have provinces. So we we have a, a three-year-old, almost three-year-old and a five-month-old. So my son's name is Dejan, which means God's gift of hope. And then my daughter, Talia, who's five months old, which is just, you know, and I get what you're saying about being a father because for me, I, I am a super dad and I and I do overcompensate and it's, you know, I literally look at my kids a lot and I'm like, I've never experienced a father-child relationship because I never had a dad. So certain things mm-hmm. that my son and I do or we all do as a family, it's really amazing because I, I see it from the child perspective because I was the child. And then I also see that from the dad perspective. And it's something that uh, there's no words for, you know, there's just really no words for. But that being said, if you were to, you know, I like to ask, I, I live in kind of a retirement community, you know, and I've done really well on my end and pushed and all that stuff. I'm 35 years old. And, you know, for me growing up, I always wanted little incremental. I have a wall behind me. I call this the I am enough wall. Will Packard, who's a movie producer, came up with this concept of I am enough wall. And he said, on those days you wake up and you feel like for whatever reason, you're just getting your ass kicked or you don't have that kind of thing. He's like, I come to this wall and I just look at it and I take a moment. That's all your accomplishments and things you did, right? I got got football helmets. I got, you know, from one of my first trips. I mean, I, I one thing for me as a childhood... My dad always, you know, I had very minor contact. At seven years old, my my mom finally said, I'm cutting all contact because there was always these promises and whatnot. And she said, you know what, Ryan, I know you might hate me for this now, but I'm cutting it. Because, you know, I, I would be the little boy sitting there at the step waiting for dad to pull up, never pulled up. And she just did not want to see that anymore. So uh, my first trip that I ever bought myself was to Jamaica because I'm half Jamaican, half German. And I said, I want to go see where I'm from. I want to see where my roots are. You know, and I got a little guy that was from that first trip. I think I bought it for like two bucks from some Jamaican guy on the beach. And I kept this thing with me for years and years. So just little incremental moments that, you know, you realize in your life. But but that being said, kind of moving forward is I do live in a retirement community. And one thing I like to ask retired people is. Did you collect a check or did you make an impact? And if you ever want to piss somebody off, I mean, I, the, 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 the reactions I've got by that question, 50% loved it. 50% thought I was just an asshole. You could tell the look on their face. Well, I mean, I mean, you know, it is kind of offensive to someone who didn't make an impact. Right. I don't give a shit though. I don't give a shit because no, 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 no. Hey, you kept it real. You kept it real. I mean, I mean, at the end of the day, man. Here's why I ask Sam, though. Here's why I ask it. I have so much respect for elders, people who are older, people who have gotten into a position that I aspire to get into the position of. So much respect. Like two ears and one mouth. I'll shut up and just listen. And when I do meet people, sometimes you know how, you know, if you ever had somebody you kind of admired and you you meet the person and you kind of get disappointed because <laughs> you're kind of like oh man I thought this person was amazing not what I, they're actually, not what I thought it was gonna be yeah so when I ask this question it's always from a place of respect but I kind of want to ask you and I know you're kind of answering but what do you think of that you know hey Mister Mrs did you collect a check or did you have an impact it's so profound man for me is definitely I did both. I first collected the check and then later on I made an impact. Now let me, me ask you know, let me ask you with the check. Do you feel and this is really interesting and um, people who create content. There's a lot of people that create content surrounding building businesses and they've never ever built a business. So the <laughs> level of credibility is maybe not the same as if there's somebody yeah. like you that says, I have built a business. I can show you I built a business. Go walk into my business. Check out my business. The level of credibility is very different. I 
I asked Patrick with David this question because I have a lot of respect for him too. And I said, Pat, it, he said, Ryan, there's different levels to the game. He said, do you want to be the commentator? Do you want to be the commentator? Do you want to be the player? Do you want to be the owner? He's Because yeah. my question to him, and I want to ask you this because I want your perspective on it is, do you feel like you should build something, then talk about it? Or talk about other people building what they're building? It's a great question. To me, you can't talk until you've done it yourself. Mm. I'm a firm mm. believer in that. I'm a firm believer in that. If I want to get advice for my marriage. Oh, you are enjoying this episode. As a further reminder, please leave a review where you are consuming this episode right now. I cannot stress how impactful and supportive this is for the show. We would really appreciate that. Also, please follow me at Ryan Holmes One on all platforms. If you would like to be a guest or you have any questions or any feedback about the show or would like some information on sponsorship opportunities for your business or for yourself, please email info at ryanholtz.ca. Remember, curiosity should always be your mandate. Much love. My business, you know, is that what I was talking about? I can't watch you. I can't watch you from a distance and think I know what you're doing. I can come replace you and, and coach people to do what you're doing. There's no way. There's... There's so many details mm. and and so many different di- different points of things that I would miss if I'm not in there with you, building it with you, you know? So it's crazy when, when, when you see that. But unfortunately, and fortunately, internet is a double-edged sword. You know, anybody can be anything, you know? And, you know, so, but also that good people, they, they, they can get their message to so many more people. So... So you just have to just do your do your due diligence and talk to the right people and and um, make sure you know you know follow that one person that you resonate with with the most that has been there done that and got the t shirt. Well, it's interesting because it, is there any and and it's a kind of a question to, to put you on the spot, but is there anybody out there? And now that you are producing your own content, and you're you're interviewing people. I watched the, the interview uh, that you did with the passionate few with Omar. You know, I really like what he does in his style as well, you know, and he does his homework. You know, you can tell somebody who interviews you that really does their homework. But even on a celebrity, like high celebrity level, is there any interviewers out there? You're like, I love their interview style. Maybe you take a piece from there. Maybe take a piece from there because in all your interviews that I see you do, you have quotes. You you talk about Tony Robbins. You talk about Ed Milet. You talk about. And it's interesting because I can tell. And that's the part I can relate to again, because. When you're a kid coming up, right, and you don't have the dad, you're a sponge. Like you are somebody who's yeah. a sponge. And I and 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 you know, it's I, I see you take a piece there, a piece there, a piece there, and then you you throw the the Bakhtiar Pers, Persian spice on it, and and that's when it I kind of becomes life. you. And I think that's life. I always tell people, I'm somewhere between Tupac Shakur and Tony Robbins. You'll find Sam. <laughs> You know what I mean? You know, you know, you know, you know what I mean? So, 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 you know, if you, you know, you, you, you get Tupac and you combine with Tony Robbins, you get Sam because I've been in the projects. I've been in the hood. I've been in, I, I, I grew up where outside of my uncle's store were pimps and prostitutes and, and drug dealers. In the meantime, I've had dinner with Tony Robbins. I had dinner and been in his private jet with Ed Milet and, 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 and some, and, and, and Andy and, and some of the some of the top people in the world. Like I literally, you know, one week I, I, I shot a documentary. I went back to my old hood because we're shooting documentary in the old hood, man. And 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 we're in the projects, in the middle of projects. Now I haven't been there for twenty years. You know, over twenty years. I've been there like in 20, 25 years. And that's a whole different neighborhood, a whole different people. They don't recognize me. I had to ask for a backup. My backup back over there is my friend's son who packs. <laughs> he comes in and makes sure you know, nothing, nothing goes down. And I'm like, I'm looking at him. I'm like, damn, Sam. It's crazy. You grew up here, but now you associate with some of the best people in the world, and that gives you that gives you a bandwidth. See, some people can only be one person with some people. Like for example, I know how to be in the, go to the hood and talk their lingo, and I can go to the White House and talk their lingo. Mm. 
Does that make sense? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, you know mm-hmm. I mean, you know, and some people can't because they don't have the bandwidth. They're one way or the other. They can't relate. I can relate to both. I can relate to both sides. Well, you're a chameleon. You you can you you can. I mean, there's different Sams, right? You can adapt. You know, you know the street culture, and then you know the. You know, I'm going to be the startup Silicon Valley culture, you know, and you you kind of have merged the two. That being said, you know, I can't speak for for the United States and the education system there, but I can in Canada, which I'm sure there's similarities. But when we were taught, especially in, you know, grade one to grade 12, very, very, you know, I had a teacher say to me, Beth, she said, Ryan, when you graduate high school, it's no different than a vehicle coming off the assembly line with a VIN number. And it's up to you to really embrace and take in what makes you different. One of the things I'm petrified about for my children is once they go into the school system, it becomes very formatted. I, I, I have always been scared of things that become extremely robotic because I think that it mm-hmm. takes the number one thing uh, that's kind mm-hmm. of your strong suit, which is you. There's never another Sam. There's never another yes. Ryan. Um, I can't tell you how many years as a kid, though, Sam, I, I was told not to be Ryan. You know, I was whether it was a teacher that said, stop talking in class, stop asking why, stop doing all these things, you know. And then these are the reasons I'm even here talking to you to this day, you know, because I do ask why, because I am curious, because I am ambitious, you know, because I'm I'm okay if somebody says no, you know, I'll crack on it again, maybe next month and I'll crack on it again the next month after that. I'll keep fucking cracking. That's just the way it happens. Someday the coconut juice is going to fucking come out. I'm going to keep cracking. Right. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. So, so and for that's, you, that's what it makes you who you are. Well, and and you know for you saying? now, like with kids and being a father and your girls, Haley and Bailey, how do you how do you feel about that when they're you know education? Like, how do you talk to them about that? How do you? I mean, I know you're you you know I'm a I know you're somebody you're a parent that's involved with school and activities and all these things. You know exactly what's going on. How does that make you feel though? Especially the fact that you kind of got to where you are. By not listening to a lot of people. I mean, you took a different path. I think that school is a great place for kids to have structure, to be able to, you know, have some kind of structure. You know, you know, because I think in life you need structure. You need to be able to you need, you need to be able to say, hey man, I need to be at a certain place by a certain time. So I think that's a lost art these days especially here in California. If somebody tells you, if you tell me, you know, you know, hey, we're going to have a, you know, we're going to have a podcast, you know, next month at, at, at 10 a.m. You don't have to tell me again. It's on there, it's locked in, it's loaded. There's no checking in, there's nothing, unless I'm in a fucking hospital, you know, unless, you know, I'm going to crash, you know, I'm going to be on there, you know. So a lot of times, it's kind of a lost art with, 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 some, with some people right there. I think school's a great way, but... Most importantly, is what you do with the kids after all that. Mm. What you expose them after that, you know. And to me, that's that's how important everything is. A lot of people, a lot of people, especially some the the people who have more money, you know, higher socioeconomic status, you know, they throw money at their children, thinking that money can solve things. So hey, go to the best schools. Go to the best school, and, and 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 then after that, I'm going to send you to this academy, and I'm going to send you this, and throw money at them. Nobody's going to teach you better than you want to teach your kids, and be able to, you know. So you got to spend quality time with them. You got to be able to, you know, show them what your perspective of life is, you know, you know what your beliefs are, and be able to guide your children. You know what I mean? You know, to be to to do the right thing. You know, I don't know if, you know, you know. Being someone who was forced into going to college and becoming a doctor, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I'm not going to force that on my children. Mm. I'm not going to force that on my children, even though they have the money right now to go to college. <laughs> they, already, they already have a, you know, account, already saved on all that kind of stuff. I said, you know, you know, if they don't want to use that money to go to college and they want to start a business, by all means, I'll take that money out and I start, mm. start a business. I want, I want to see their business plan and all that kind of stuff. So, I'm, I'm very, very open minded. I'm not I don't want to be the old school per- Persian dad that, oh, yeah, it's only one way you do things. You got to go do this and you got to do that. So I want them to be creative. I want them to, to go out there and explore the world and, and come up with their own hustle. 
When you went back, when you, you said you're filming a documentary, when you went back to where you grew up in, in, in the hood, what? How did you feel? How does it make you feel? How does it make Bro, you feel? <sighs> bittersweet. Bittersweet. You know. You know, bitter in a way, in, in a sense that that I go back and I see some of my friends that I love so much. Mm. And they're there still doing the same thing. Hanging around the same people. Driving the same car. Hanging around in the same bar. Like, it's been, let me see, I left there when I was 18 years old. Gosh, that's like, what, 26 years ago, 27 years ago. I go back and people haven't changed one bit. And that to me is just, gosh, sad. Because how can you literally waste your whole life not knowing anything outside of your little circle? Right? You know, it's almost like a dog that it's almost like a dog that's been in a, in a, in, a, in a cage, it's never gone anywhere, or just inside of one home. You know, so to me, that's the that's the bitterness of it. You know, the sweet part of it is is going out there and be like, wow. I can't believe I made it out of here, you know, and it's crazy because not many people have, you know, you know, not many people have made it out of there, you know, um, being successful. They either got caught up in the drugs or shooting or gangs or, or, you know, you know, they, they're just average people, you know what I mean? And, um, the, because of the mentality, because of, of the mentality, you know, you know, you gotta realize it's a, it's a very depressed area. You know, a lot of steel mills shut down. If you make twenty bucks an hour there, you are making it big time. Mm. Mm. I, I mean, you, you you're said, the man. <laughs> you said something that if somebody was driving like something nicer than an Accord or I can't remember what car you use, you're like you're 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 a heat bag. Like they're pulling you over. <laughs> if, 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 if you drive a Honda Accord or better. You know, you, you better be a doctor, lawyer, or somebody in their 40s and 50s. <laughs> if you're a young kid uh-huh. driving a Honda Accord, you got pulled over and searched, no questions asked. No questions asked. There's no way that you, you can have that, you know, not dealing drugs. I got pulled over many times, man, because where the drugs at? Where the drugs at? Where the drugs at? I'm like, what do you mean? Why? Because I had a Toyota MR2? Because that, that, that I worked day and night for? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> to be, be able to afford it's, it's crazy. To this day, to this day, some people still say Sam was a drug dealer. Mm-hmm. If you go back to my foot, because I hang around thugs and because I had some, I, I, I had, I, you know, hang around some thugs, I, I, went, I hung around, you know, thing, and because I had some, I had a nice car to their standards, which is a <laughs> piece of shit in California <laughs> standards. You know what I mean? You know, yeah. a, a, a Toyota, a Toyota, a Toyota sports car is that shit over there. You know what I mean? And they're like, oh, there's no way, man. Now, you know, he was slanging drugs, man, because he was hanging around. I never slang drugs. I never did drugs. Never done none of that. When you know, and uh, and to this day, man, there, 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 you know, there's certain certain things, man, that people people have that. Oh yeah, man, he did. He, he slammed drugs. Mm. What do you think? I mean. They're still there and you're where you are now. One word as to why. If you could say one word. Proximity. 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 I mean, I, I'll cut you off. I don't even need to hear the whole sentence. You know, proximity. You know what I mean? Like, like if I would have stayed there, guess what? I would have done the same shit. I mean, look, when I came to California for the first time, I remember I thought I was coming to Beverly Hills. When I first came to America, because <laughs> I was watching those, they're like, you're in America. I was watching Dallas Dynasty in the 18, you know, it's like the Kardashians of today. You know, I'm like, oh shit, everybody got mansions and everybody got Cadillacs and swimming pools and Bentleys. And, you know, I came in, I went to Sharon, Pennsylvania, the one of the worst neighborhoods to this day that I've ever seen. People were like, oh, Compton is the hood. Compton is the hood. Compton has palm trees. Compton is not the hood. <laughs> What do you mean Compton is the hood? Compton, you drive 20 minutes from Compton, you're going to go to Long Beach, beautiful beaches and beautiful people, high risers. You go 30 minutes from Compton, you go to Beverly Hills, so you can you see people drive, so you're exposed to different shit. Sharon, Pennsylvania is the middle of no fucking where. Mm. You, have no, you have no exposure to anything good. So I remember back in the day, like 
one of the best cars I've ever seen was a BMW 3 Series or 5 Series in the area. And that was like a doctor that owned businesses and this and this and this and that. So when I came to California, I remember I was driving, I took my little R2 Toyota and across the country with that little two-seater. I'm driving over, I get to California, BMW, Mercedes, Bentley, BMW, Audi. I'm like, what the fuck? I went to a mall here, you know, there, there's a designer mall here called South Coast Plaza. You know, so I went there for the first time, man. I couldn't, I didn't even go to the mall because I was outside peeking in these cars like this. Oh my God, look at the interior. Oh my God, because my mind was blown. So I remember going to the mall, I'm going to go, I'm going to, go to the mall and I look at a t-shirt, like a nice designer shirt, $100. My mind was blown. My mind was blown because I had suits that cost $100. Mm -hmm. so full on suits. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, so I bought full on suits for $99. And then there's a t-shirt, a white t-shirt with Versace on it. It's $100. I'm like, what the fuck? I'm like, my mind. And then I see all these people shopping, have all these bags, and they get in their Benz and Bentleys and all that kind of stuff. And I, my mind was just like, oh my God, what are these, these people do? And it wasn't one person, it was hundreds of people. And now when I go over there and I shop and I <laughs> they pull out the Rolls Royce in the freaking, in the valet, I'm going like, oh my God, I used to be me. I went, I went to the Louis Vuitton store in Pittsburgh. I went to the Louis Vuitton store in Pittsburgh because I, I needed some luggage. I bought a few luggages. And I saw these two black kids, young black kids, right? They're right there and they're like looking at me. You're going to buy that? Oh my God, you can afford that? And that reminded me of that. I was them. I was them. I was them looking at those people at that time, looking at them like, how are you going to be able to buy that? I what exposed you, them what did, to, what, did, what did you say to them, Sam? Like, what did you say to them? Because that was you. Like, what do you say to them? I, I told them, yeah, I bought that. I said, you know what, man? Because of growing up, I never thought this was possible. But I worked hard. I stayed on course. I told them I stayed away from drugs and alcohol. I made sure I threw that in. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And, mm -hmm. and, and I said, I kept on hustle. And this is what I got. And I showed them some pictures of my cars just to inspire them, not to brag. I don't want to try to brag to little kids. Mm. I just to inspire them, man, to see what's possible. You know, I don't, I don't want to be window shop the rest of their life. I want them to be one, one day out there, you know, you know, inspiring people. I don't, you know, it's not about the material things. It's the fact that you can. Mm. We talk, we talk a lot about community and generational wealth. It's amazing. I read a, I read a study. If you take East Indian people and Chinese, if you look at a lot of the ghettos in the States, the little bodegas, corner stores, they're owned by, you know, Asian or East Indian or Iranian. When we take one dollar, because I, I, I come at it from the black person perspective, it's amazing. The average Asian community, let's say it's I'm an Asian guy and I spend one dollar, that dollar will circulate in the Asian community for 30 days minimum. Do you know what it is in the black person culture? Less than 30 what? minutes. <laughs> and not even. Yeah. 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 Right? So, you know, so you know. I mean, you're a finances guy too. I mean, you think about money. You have to think about money differently. You know, I always say if you want money, you got to really kind of start being a little smart about money. You have to think about money and how money's really made and passive income and earned income and portfolio income and all these different things. What do you think about all that? That's amazing. That's crazy, bro. I, I grew up. I grew up in the hood, in 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 in, in a black neighborhood. My mm. mom say, my mom say, she says, why you what you know you, you sound like a black person. Why? <laughs> <laughs> That's what she said. She goes, she she's old school Persian, and and they're very prejudiced. That's yeah. how they, they were. They don't yeah. know any better. They're ignorant. You know what I mean? Yeah. They're ignorant. You know what I mean? They don't know. Yeah. They don't know any better. I'm like, mom, have you forgot when we came to America? Where the fuck you dropped me off? <laughs> I grew up among black people. That's why I mean, like, that's that's what I do. But here's what I noticed. Here's what I noticed, and it's a sad truth. I mean, when you go through Beverly Hills, have you ever you ever, you ever drove through Beverly Hills? I have. I have. Okay. Do you see McDonald's and Burger King in every fucking corner? You see Popeyes in every corner. You don't see none of that. You don't see none of that. You go to a black neighborhood or the hood, you see every corner, there's a liquor store, you know, there's food, this, 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 and that. Why? Because when I was in, a, in when, when, when I was in a black neighborhood, man, 
we were popping. Our store was popping. We were selling subs. We were selling pizza. I was delivering wings. You know, I, I remember I used to deliver wings to the uh, dinner, $40, $50 a night to this lady in the hood that her house reeked of pee because she has cats and dogs in it. We, I mean, I, I couldn't, I, I had to go like this, right? I mean, visibly she was poor as shit because the house was bad. Everything looked like the house was ready to fall apart. A 50, 40, $50 order every night. Mm. Now you think, you think millionaire, millionaires do that? Millionaires don't even eat 40, $50 every night. They cook the stuff at home, right? <laughs> But, but, in the, but in the hood, they're out eating all the time. They're out spending money that they don't got on food. On food. Maybe you can eat for five dollars at home. Just all you gotta do is get your lazy ass up, go cook something. You know what I mean? But you know, it, 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 it was a sad truth. It, 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 it was it was it was just a sad truth when I went over there. My uncle thought he was making a big move. So he sold his store in the hood after five years for a big profit. Mm. Then he went, then he went up, he went up the street for a few miles. And got a better store in a better neighborhood. Ah, uh, guess what? The sales went down man. because people, because because people who are on higher socioeconomic status, whether they're black or white, has nothing to do with color. Has whether they're black or white, they don't eat out every night. They don't eat see, out every night. I, lo- I love this. I love this. I, see, this is the part I like talking about because. It's taking everything. I mean, you got all the cars, man, the supercars and all that. You're sitting in a beautiful place. You have all the material and you're still talking about a $40, $50 a night just eating out at the corner store. And this is where I bro, talk. I'm I, you, bro, I'm bro I, I, I still think I'm broke. I still think I'm broke. Like me and my wife sometimes get into it because my wife is totally cut from a different cloth. Like, like she's holy cow. Like she's been with a mom and dad to have amazing marriage. I mean, I mean, I had, I'm sure everybody had the rock, but her mom and dad was a great provider. To this day, his, her dad works 80 hours, you know, 80 hours a week. You know, seriously, like 80 hours a week. You know, she works and provides for them and things like that. She, you know, her she she'll come home. You know, when I was first dating her, she'll take my car and bring it back dirty and with no gas. After mm. a couple of times, I was like, this chick, what the hell is wrong with this chick? Like, it's common courtesy. You take somebody's mm. car, wash it, put gas in it. Then I remember, that then then one day her brother was like, yeah, you know, Crystal gets in the car and car without putting gas in it. Her dad filled up her tank all the time. Mm. So so when, when we got together, like, you know, like she's like, oh, yeah, baby, you know, I'm kind of hungry. Let's order Postmates. Let's order this. I'm like, that's like a $7 delivery charge. <laughs> <laughs> Like, yes. Why would I seven dollars? Right. Yes. I, I still think like that because I had to be. Mm. I had to be. I don't. I don't. I don't have. You know. Even to this day, like my mentality is not. Oh, Sam, I got millions. I'm broke. I still need to hustle. Mm. It's it's true. I, I shared a story. There's a guy on Instagram the other day. He sent me a picture of his of his of him cutting his son's hair. In the it's a very symbolic picture because. When my mom passed away at 13, I like to get my hair cut once a week. Once a week, you know, maybe $15, $20. So I bought myself my own haircutting kit. I saved the yep. money that I would spend on haircuts from 13 years old to 18 years old. That accumulated to $5,000. That was what I used as a down payment for my first apartment condo flip. And it's a small gesture, but it's a big principle. And... You know, I tell people all the time that, you know, especially they're like, Ryan, you know, I, it's hard to pull money. No, no, no. You might have to give up a couple things, but really look at the finances. Like I, I seen you in an interview and you talked about, you know, you, you were broke not that long ago. You know, you lost everything, made a whole bunch of money and everything went 2008 hit and you went sideways. And you said, man, I started looking at my credit card statement saying, who the hell's this? They're charging me for this. And you start d- taking inventory and canceling everything saying, oh my God. These twenty dollars, thirty dollars, hundred dollars every month it adds up, adds right? Up, adds up, man. I ha- highly recommend, you know, reading a book called Automatic Millionaire. Ah, uh, great. You know book. what I mean? You know, you know, yeah, great book, man. I mean, when I read that book, it just, you know, you know, it t- it talks about the latte factor. You know, you know, you know, that little Starbucks shit. You don't think it's going to add up? It adds up. When when I was able to, you know, you know, save and 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 create some wealth was, you know, I, I, I've talked about it before, I'm gonna say it here again, 
was, you know, when um, when my you know, my ex wife hit me with the divorce papers, you know, and I was just com- I was, you know, what, you know, and 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 when the when the when the economic crash hit in two thousand eight, and then my my ex wife hit me with divorce papers in two thousand fourteen, for a period of time, I went into preservation mode, you know, when where I was I'm, I gamified how much I cannot spend, literally. Mm. How much I can not spend. I will leave the house with five dollars in my pocket. No credit cards, mm. nothing. I will leave the house with only five dollars in my pocket. And my game was I cannot spend more than five dollars today. I took my food, I took everything with me, and if I needed to get gas, it was five dollars that I had to fill up. You know, and I and, and, and I used to fill up with the company card, you know, which we do, the company card, and I went to Raps. Because Ralph's, you know, one of my, you know, Ralph's a grocery store that has, you know, a cheap gas. And my business partner came up, to me, why, why are you getting groceries on the company card? I go, no, man, I got, you know, it's, it's, they got cheap gas. You know, <laughs> like, you know. so for, for, for a period of, I would say, four or five years, I've made it a point not to spend money on nothing. Mm-hmm. I was going, I was going through a divorce, and I'm like, you know what, I'm just going to, I went and got a little apartment. I live in an apartment, and I said, I'm not going to spend money on anything. I drove the company Scion Xbox, <laughs> mm. and I drove that for four or five years. You know, I felt like my balls was cut off because I'm a car guy. I like muscle. I like power. I like, mm. that's that's what I like ever since I was a little kid. I'm like, no, nah, no. Nah. I delayed gratification for four or five years. I was making a lot of money, but I wasn't spending nothing. In 2007, I came to this neighborhood where my where, where, where I live right now. It's called the Villano, which is like the, the best neighborhood in Chino Hills. Mm. And the smallest home here was 1.6 million. The smallest home. And I remember, you know, having four or 500 grand saved up. I thought I was man. You know, I was going, oh, yeah, I got, you know, I'm going to put 500 grand down. I'm going to do this and that. I got outbid by cash every single time. I got outbid by cash. So that scarred me. I'm like, man, how does people got $1.6 million just sitting here? You know, I, I couldn't believe it, you know, but when I came back, when I saved, I came, I bought a custom home, you know, $3.2 million, mm. no finance needed. There you go. Cash, mm. you know, you know, so, so I've learned from my mistakes before. And, and now even to this day where, you know, we have plenty of money, plenty of passive income. I don't like throwing money away. I don't like throwing money away. I, I don't like going to Starbucks every day. I don't like, you know, you know, uh, doing Postmates. Even like, like last night, we got we got Postmates because we want to watch the Steelers and Steelers and Chargers play. You know, you know, my, my in laws came in. I'm like, all right, this could post. I'm like, I'm seven dollars delivery fee. <laughs> <laughs> Sam, I, I see, I see all these books on the back of your wall. One of the only ones you have doubles of is Robert Greene: Laws of Human Nature over your left shoulder. Is this? Yeah. Why do you have double a double book of Laws of Human Nature? Have you read this book? I have read the book. When a when book I like so much, I buy multiple copies because I want to give it away. Okay. Why this so book? Some- what, what's the meaning behind that book for you? I've re- I have the book up here too. It's a beautiful book. Why is that book big for you? Because, I mean, you know, life is all about the psychology of getting to know people and how people react. Mm. You know what I mean? You know, you know, life is all, you know, you know we're, all, we're all different, but we're all s- still wired a certain way. One of the best books on the subject, man, that I've ever read also is called Influence mm. by Robert Chaldon. You know, mm. it talks about six weapons of influence and how you can influence people the right way. Mm. And to me, once you understand what makes people tick and how people are, are, are emotionally bound, then you can talk to them more effectively. And at the end of the day, when you can talk to people more effectively, you can become a better leader. And to me, you know, being, you know, being, being a better leader is what's all about whether you're a leader of your company whether you're a leader of your household, or you're a leader of your, you know, you know, major football team, mm. you know, you got to be, you got to be able to, you know, get people to move the way you want them to move. Interesting, interesting. So let me ask you this: It's kind of a, let's picture a table. If you take the internet, it's amazing. A very small, select few people create over ninety percent of the content consumption on the internet, which is amazing, right? You're now putting your your yourself into the mix of, you know, a content creator with your 1% podcast and then you're going on other people's podcasts and YouTube shows and things like that. 
And I get asked this question a lot because people say, Ryan, how did you manage to get this guest on your show? Right? How do you select who you give the most precious thing you could ever give to somebody? Your time, because you never get it back. How do you select that? Is there a series? When somebody hits you up on Instagram, for example, because I'm sure you got to be getting hit up a lot. How do you know whether, okay, you know, thanks for hitting me up, but, you know, I got to pass on this. Like, how do you manage your time, right? Patrick David is known in the industry. It's hard to get him on your show, any show. He doesn't do a lot of, like, interviews where he's the guest. He interviews people on his show. And, I mean, I talk to Pat, you know, and I'm public because people ask him, like, I talked to him over the course of eight to nine months on Instagram. I don't know him. I just said, hey, one day I said, Pat, I love your stuff. It was one video. That was it. The next week, Pat, I was thinking about that book you mentioned. I, like, I was talking to you like me and you were friends. Just imagine some guy messaging you. Oh, hey, Sam. Tell Haley and Bailey I say hi. <laughs> You're like, who is this guy? How do you select that? It's so... It's a powerful question. You know, it's, it's a very, it's, it's, it's a very powerful question. And I wish I had a formula. I don't have a formula. Mm. You know, you know, if I feel somebody is genuine, mm. if somebody has, you know, in, in a genuine way, wants to interview me, wants to get a good, and and is value driven first. Mm. Then I'll give them a chance. You know what I mean? Rather than, you know, somebody is, is, is a taker. Hey, I want to interview yeah. you. And that's just, I don't, you know, you know, I don't, I'm a type of person. I give my shirt off back with people, you know, and, mm. you know, I don't look at somebody, how many followers do they have and how much exposure do I get? And, and you know, and all that kind of stuff, because no matter what I do. Use the content. I'll, I'll, you know, I'll use the content. I'll be able to repurpose the content. I'm gonna. It's, it's about their approach. You know, that's absolutely, it makes sense. The approach is. So for people out there, though, because I think coming from you, you know, a lot of people have a lot of respect for you, you know, and then you also have a lot of respect for a lot of other people. And it's kind of this push and pull, you know, I had another gentleman on the podcast and he said, Ryan, the art of even getting a guest on a podcast, that's a whole nother art itself. You know, if you want to interview somebody, you're right. There's 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 a kind of a push and pull, a certain amount of energy. Everybody can smell the take. It it smells like shit. Everybody can smell a take right with no value based. And I think it's for people who are listening to the podcast. I mean, even when I get hit up, man, there's people that make me feel like I want to do the world. I don't even know how they do it. Just the way they approached. I want to do everything. And I don't even know them. Then there's other people. They made me feel dirty. <laughs> if that makes sense. They just made me feel no, bad about it. I don't know why they made me feel this way, but they did. Life is all about approach, isn't it? It you know, is. You, you can, I, I, same thing, just differently. Oh, absolutely. It has a whole, whole different meaning. You know, and you can kind of, a lot of times from an email, see you know, somebody about what they're, what they're coming from, you know. And, and there's a lot, of, a lot of, like, fake care as well, where people says, hey, I'm a big fan of yours. You know, this is not, I really want to interview you, you this and this and that. And I'm going like, you are? I'm like, I don't see you like any of the posts or you 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 made a comment for the past year or something like that. You know, so there's a lot of fake, you know, fake, fake, fake stuff like that going on. And for the most part, if somebody had the right approach, you know, um, you know, like I said, I, I, I will give them a chance because there's people like Grant Cardone and Andy Frasillas and, and, and Ed Milet stuff that have come on on my podcast and and have, have given me, you know, have given me the opportunity. So, you know, it's my duty to be able to give something back to them as well. Absolutely. No, I, 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 think, I think that's great. Uh, what is your number one? And we're going to, we're going to kind of, you know, get on the wrap up, but what is the number one thing you love about social media and what it's done for the world and accessibility? And what's the one thing maybe you just can't stand about social media? Well, the, the best thing about social media is that people like you and I now can have a platform can be able to talk about our lives, talk about our, 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 you know, what we have gone through life, how we overcome it, you know, be able to share our story to the masses. And so, so it has opened up the platform for so many people to be able to do so much good 
to the world, mm. you know. And also, also the bad thing I don't I don't like about social media is when people use social media to compare themselves. Mm. You know, mm. to me, comparison is a thief of joy. You know, you know, you know, you know. If you want, once you start comparing yourself to other people, that's when you start really, really declining your mental health. And and start declining in how you feel and then what you want out of life, you know. And I, I've never been that person to compare myself with others. I'm, I've never been, you know. If somebody has something better than me, I'm happy for them. I want to be a part of it. You know what I mean? You know, you know. If you if you rolled up in a Bugatti tomorrow, bro, like I'll be fucking ringing you up, like, bro, I want to ride in that motherfucker. You know, <laughs> Like, like, you know what I mean? Like, I, I genuinely, am, I am, I am. Like, I'll be bugging you. Like, I can't wait to you know ride in it and, and and this and that. But unfortunately, man, people that start comparing them and and, and they start hating and, and all that kind of stuff. Man, yeah, like you said earlier in the podcast, you know, your superpower is you. Your mm. unique is, is you. You know, nobody, nobody. I would not trade me for anybody. Mm. Not anybody. I don't want to be anybody. I don't want to be, you know, you know, Bill Gates and be a multi. I don't want to be Bill. You know, I don't want to be Oprah. Mm. I don't want to be the homeless guy either. Mm. You know, I don't care. I want to be me. And I just want to work on me and become the best version of me. And whoever has better things and better things and, and all that kind of stuff, by all means, I love it. It inspires me. It inspires me, you know what I mean? If Ed Milet has a jet, well, shit, I'm inspired, man. I'm going to sit down in this jet. I'm like, damn, it. You know, how do I get one? Show me the way. Mm. I love it. You are somebody that, I mean, when I watch your stuff, it's amazing. First impressions. We all are, we all, we all, we have to all agree as human beings, we are all judgmental. And if anybody tells me they're not judgmental, they're not a human being. Now, the difference yeah. is, is that, the difference is that, are you judgmental? Like, just kind of like how you say your mom is, right? It's like, She's just Persian and boom. But it's like, can you be judgmental but then still get past that and be like, oh, well, wait a sec. Let's let's do a little deep dive here and then come to our conclusion, so to speak, right? So I never judge a book by its cover. But you're somebody that every interaction, any video I've watched of, of you, whether you're in a group setting or you're one-on-one, -on -one, you're always trying to bring people together. Cohesiveness. Like, I can't picture you not getting along with many people. Like, you're the guy at the party that's really gelling everybody you seem like just great vibes. Black, Chinese, Indian, per like you just vibe it. It's amazing. However, your assumption of not anybody liking me or like that is is, is totally false. Because there's a lot of people who don't like me. And let me tell you why. Mm. You know, because I'm very, very, very careful who I surround myself with. Mm. I'm very, very I just know what I want in life. And if somebody doesn't fit that, it won't work for me. For mm. example, if for example, if if you are if you are my employee, and we or, or we work together, and we got to be here somewhere at seven o'clock, and you constantly are showing up, that for that it has to do with any kind of relationship. It only has to do with with me. I can't be around that energy. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So, so for me, it's Absolutely. very important for me to, to to watch my circle. I allow anybody who wants to be in my circle be my circle, but I have to be held in certain standards. <laughs> if you want to be in my circle, there are standards that you have to meet. Mm. You know what I mean? And 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 those are just you know because I, I just don't you know and you know like I love everybody, but. If I want to be, you, you got to be in my close proximity, there are standards. And not everybody can meet to that standards because I'm very stringent on those, sta on those standards. I'm, I'm borderline psychotic and, 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 you know, I demand that much. I, hey, I get up at three o'clock in the morning. I hit the gym at four o'clock. I don't, I don't expect that of everybody. But guess what? If I'm here as a multimillionaire getting up at three o'clock in the morning, hustling all day and doing things and you want to be like me, but you're not willing to show up at eight o'clock in the morning at the right time. <laughs> By eight o'clock in the morning, I already have done half of my work. <laughs> you know what I mean? We're gonna have issues. You feel me? 
<laughs> me saying that though is not i feel like i mean you're in a different you're in a different category but your peers your peers which is very different than a lot of other people's peers they, 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 I mean by that is they, they would love you because you're you're on that same level, that same thought pattern, that same energy level. People who are aspiring, I mean, sometimes to be something like you, I mean, you're going to make that person feel like shit. <laughs> That's the truth. Like somebody will look at you and love your stuff. And then when they realize the work it takes, you know how people are. Their attitude starts to change a bit. It goes from really love him to fuck him because it's a it's it's like the laws of human nature it, it all is very dependent on who that person is inside themselves with, with, with my inner circle you know um people that are close to me i always let them know i said look i said everything that i'm going to say to you ever is never personal it's out of love i don't want anything from you i don't want nothing from you mm. but i want to make an impact for you you know and sometimes, you know, it's going to come out perfectly. And sometimes we're going to have a locker room talk. Mm. We're going to straight have a locker room talk. I, there, there's, there's times that me and my team got together or, or, or I had a locker room talk with my inner circle, which, which was F-bombs and, and, and everything along with it with emotion. You know, actually, I have recorded a couple of those. Mm. Recorded a couple. Of, you know, you, people like, God, God, Sam, you know, you know, but, but it's, it's, it's for me. It's all about making an impact. If I have to have a locker room talk to make an impact, or if I have to sit down and, and have a tea with you, a kind of impact, I want to make an impact. You know what I mean? And I want to make, make sure, you know, when, when my kids grow up, I don't want to, I, I don't want to, I don't care if they say, you know, my, I was my, that my dad was my best friend. Mm. That's cool if that happens. But if I was their best friends, I didn't help them accomplish nothing in life. Then I don't need that. I'd rather say, you know what, my dad was hard on me, but I wouldn't be where I'm at because of him. My job is not, my job as a parent and as a leader is to develop people to their potential, not be their best buddies. Mm. Now, if that becomes, if that if, if that's possible, then by all means, I'll be best buddies for him in this and that. But if it not, it's, I don't care about that. You know, I have, you know, I claim to fame to this day. My biggest fulfillment is I have helped a couple of dozen people become millionaires. Mm. You know, I've so many people in so many different ways, you know, that, that they, they're able to have a great life right now because of the impact I made them. That to me is fulfilling. Not, oh, well, I'm best friends with 24 people. Mm. Who care less about that? Mm. I don't need Sam, my last question for you is always, and I always end off, what can I do for you? Yep. Well, brother... You know, first of all, you already done enough. I appreciate the fact that you have so many other people to reach out to. You chose me mm. to be on your podcast. That's by itself. It's an honor, honor and a privilege. And I'm forever grateful. You know, to me, just be somebody on my contact list that I can that that I can um, that, that I can reach out to when I need to. You might be That's never. You <laughs> might. Be, I like that. It might be every week. It might be every week. But knowing someone that's going to be there for you, no matter what, that's hard to find. I have friends that we don't talk for months. Mm. But I know that if I get a flat tire at one o'clock in the morning, or if I need to get bailed out at two o'clock in the morning, I can call them. They will be there. Mm. You feel me? Mm. That's what I want. I don't need I don't need money I don't need favors I don't need anything I need to know if I can, if I can count on someone if I can count on someone they'll be on speed dial because you never know you always need people that you can count on I love that man I appreciate that so much um oh Sam this has been absolutely amazing I uh like I said I, I watched so much stuff on you I did my homework You've gotten asked a lot of the same questions. You've given the same answers because that's your story. Um, so everybody who's listening to the show, again, I'm going to put Sam's contact info and all that stuff, all that good stuff in there. Go check him out. I, I really wanted to capture more of a, a mental mind of Sam because I feel like once you know the person behind the success, you can really take a lot from that. 
Um, Sam, thank you so much for being on the show. I appreciate you. I'm sending love to your whole family from my family here in Canada. Likewise, Um, man. Likewise, beautiful family as well. Everybody who's listening to the show, uh, please do not forget to like, review, subscribe on iTunes. Uh, You have all my contact information. Again, curiosity should always be your mandate. Sam, thank you so much again, my man.